Okay, welcome back again. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, today we're going to start a new book in our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. We'll be starting today in the book of 2 Peter. Now, last time we finished up 1 Peter, verse-by-verse, -verse, and I was surprised how long that went. Uh, the more I studied, the more God gave me, and I just said, well, i got to give that, i got to give that. So it was very fun to me to do that Bible study and to teach it verse-by-verse, -verse, and, and the Lord just give me things from the Word. And I had a great time doing that. And then uh, a lot of people say, well, where's 2 Peter? Where's 2 Peter? Well, I took a little bit of time off, a week or two, in order to just kind of rest. It takes a lot out of you sometimes. And uh, this is the hot summer, and, and well, sometimes in the summer you just got to get out and go do some stuff. Uh, fishing and uh, surfing, and I want to get out there and go sailing soon, Lord willing. So I, I kind of put it on hold for a week or two, but now we're back. And I'll keep coming every week with a new teaching as we study verse by verse through the book of 2 Peter. Now, 2 Peter has three chapters, 61 verses, and 1,559 words. Now, of course, that's King James Bible. All right, new versions take out words. So in new versions, there's a lot less words. Matter of fact, the modern NIV, what does that stand for? Non-inspired version or something like that? Oh, new international version. The NIV has 60-something thousand words less than the King James Bible. Well, I believe God gave us his word the way he wanted it in English in the King James. And so I want all the words of God, not a watered-down version that takes out verses and words and things like that. So when I give you up here the verses and the chapters and how many words, I'm always saying from a King James because I'm King James only. I believe it came from the correct text. And all new versions of the Bible come from the perverted text, the critical text, the Catholic text, the Gnostic text. And those are what scholarship wants to push. They want you to get their version of the Bible based upon the Gnostic Catholic critical text which are texts that have a whole lot less verses because somebody went through there with a knife cutting them out. I, that dog won't hunt. No, I'm going to stick with the King James Bible, the true Word of God that has all the words of God in it. Now, the, the book of 1 Peter was written by Peter around 66 A.D. Now, I find that very, very interesting when I say it was written around 66 A.D. because you have Paul and Peter getting together learning from each other, knowing each other. And so what's interesting is Paul's last book in the Bible was the book of 2 Timothy. And it was also written about 66 AD. So these two men knew each other and were writing around the same time. Matter of fact, Paul is mentioned in the book of 2 Peter. And I can't wait to show you that as well. So it was written in 66 AD or thereabouts couple of years before the destruction of Israel, which, by the way, was around 70 A.D., if you know your history. Now, you also have to remember, when Peter is writing this epistle, he is not writing from Rome. Your modern versions of the Bible change the Bible yet again and have Peter in Rome. But we looked, as we finished up last time, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13, Peter's writing, and he says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. So he's saying, hey, we in Babylon, well, the church here, we salute you, and we're in Babylon. So Peter was in Babylon, not in Rome. Why is that important? Because the Roman Catholic Church tries to tell you, the first pope was Peter. <laughs> and no, that doesn't work. He was a bishop, he was a pastor, if you will, but he wasn't the first pope because there are no popes in the Bible. But they have to twist the scriptures. They have to change it. They have to try to make you think that their church is right. And yet their church is based upon the texts of the Bible that take out whole verses and things like that. So watch out for that denomination which is ridden with child molestation. Um, if you know anything about the Catholic Church, you know how many pedophiles there were in it. Also, if you know anything about the Catholic Church, there's a lot of false doctrine. And I'm a King James Bible-believing independent Baptist, and I believe what the Bible says. Well, the Catholics don't. The Catholic Church says, no, you believe what the Pope says. Well, one time a Pope said this, and then about a thousand years later a Pope said the opposite. Which one are you supposed to believe? <laughs> Neither, because these are men pretending to be in the place of God. Matter of fact, that's what vicar of Christ means. It means in place of God. I don't follow men. I follow the Bible. Okay? And uh, you want to be a Roman Catholic? That's your business. But even that church doesn't teach how to get to heaven. 
they teach you to do the best you can, go to the Mass, do this, do that, go to confession, do all this, and the best you can hope for when you die is, oh, you're going to burn in purgatory. What a horrible religion. No, the Bible tells me, Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. When I die, I go to be with Jesus Christ because of his blood that he shed for me. Now, Peter and Paul knew each other, and uh, they lived around the same time. They were writing around the same time. And uh, Peter wrote from Babylon, not Rome. But this is the last book of Peter. This is what we call his swan song, if you will. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in a minute, minute. But a swan song is basically your last big speech before you die. And it's interesting, this is Peter's last writing, and then he was killed. He died as a martyr for Jesus shortly after writing the book of 2 Peter. Same thing with Paul, from what we understand. Paul was killed by the Roman Empire, Roman, the Romans, watch out for Romans, and uh, he wrote 2 Timothy in about the same year, and that was his last book that he wrote. So there's a lot of things that Peter and Paul have in common, and you need to understand that, you need to realize that, and that's important. Now, the book of 1 Peter was all about suffering, as you'll remember. Well, the book of 2 Peter, the theme of it, I would say, is grow and know. Peter is writing this book and he's saying, look, I just want you to remember some things. I want you to grow as a Christian. I want you to know that being a Christian isn't just believing in something. It's learning the Bible and, and reading the scriptures and memorizing it and learning more and growing. As you read the scriptures, you grow as a Christian and you have it in your heart when you're saved because you're believing from the heart in the finished work of Christ. But now in your head, memorize as much scripture as you can and go out and teach others. And that reminds me of Paul. Well, what was Paul saying? Doctrine is the most important thing. <laughs> well, that's what it sounds like Peter is saying also is doctrine is so important. Make sure. What did Paul say? Give heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. So make sure we have our doctrine straight. Why? Because there's false prophets out there going around trying to change the doctrine that was given to the early church. So you got to watch out for that. So the key words in the book of 2 Peter are glory. And he's kind of talking more about the second advent. You remember in 1 Peter Bible study where we talked about how there's a double application to Jews in the tribulation, but also to the church? Well... Maybe we can look at that and see if we can find any possible dual applications in 2 Peter. And sure enough, there, there are some. So the, the book of 1 Peter had kind of a dual application where he's writing to Jews in the tribulation. But obviously, and as we looked before, there's a lot that lines up with Paul in the church age that is for us today. So when we go through 2 Peter, we're going to look at as much as we can to take for us today. Okay? But also... Knowledge, remembrance, and then he talks a lot about watch out for false prophets, which is interesting because we looked at that in the book of Jude. We looked at, at Paul saying the same thing. And so there were a lot of people, and, and well, maybe in the future if we ever get to the book of Revelation, I'll show you how in the book of Revelation, John, the apostle John, warns of false apostles who, who claim they are apostles but are found liars. There are a lot of people that pretend to be Christians. Because their desire is to come in and change and twist and pervert Christianity so that they can get rich off of it. And that's what a false prophet does. Someone who comes in, doesn't teach the Bible, teaches religion, teaches man's teachings rather than scripture, in order to put you into bondage so that now you have to look up to them and pay them money. And I've seen people like that. I think it's so sad. And that's what religion is. Religion really is a racket. That's why I like to say I'm not a religious person. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I'm born again. A religion is a system of works that man says you have to do in order to get to heaven. And no, the Bible says no, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. So there's a difference between religion and salvation. Okay? And today we're saved by faith, not by works. Now under the Old Testament there was a great element of works involved. And so what people try to do is they try to mix the Old Testament and New Testament to try to get you to think, if I don't do these good works, well, then God won't accept me. And that's not Christianity. Christianity is we're saved by faith only today, not by works. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do good works. We do works after we're saved because we are saved. But we're not doing those thinking that that will save us. We don't do works to get saved. 
Works don't save us. We're saved by faith alone. So, the book of 2 Peter has only three chapters. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it was written in 66 AD. Now, if you know the, the Bible in the early church, okay, here's John, the apostle, who shows up, and he's announcing the coming of Christ, and Jesus is the Christ, and he's the Messiah. That's what Christ means, the Messiah. Well, he had his earthly ministry here, and then up shows old Peter and the early apostles. And Peter shows up, and then comes Paul later. Now, in the early book of Acts, well, it's all about the Jews. And, and from here on, it's all about the Jews until the Jews as a whole, as a nation, reject their Messiah. It was Stephen. And then God goes more to the Gentiles. But it's interesting. They knew Jesus. All right, Peter would have seen Jesus. Paul most likely did see Jesus one time, uh, probably when he was dying on the cross. He was probably there looking. How far away he was, we don't know. So they would have seen Jesus, and they would have heard the words of Jesus where Jesus says, I'm coming back. I'm going to return again. I will come again and receive you unto my own. All they had was the Old Testament when Jesus said that, so they're reading it, and they're finding all these places in the Old Testament where God judges Israel for 40 years. Another passage, God judges Israel for 70 years. So my thought was, uh, as the early church is going along, they're probably sitting there thinking, well, it's not going to be much longer, and Jesus is going to come back. They didn't realize it would be almost 2,000 years until the rapture would take place. They were thinking in, in their lifetime. Um, remember what Paul says in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4? The we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. Paul was thinking the rapture would be in his lifetime. So put yourself in the mindset of these early Christians, and all you have is the Old Testament, and you had a little bit of what Christ Jesus said, but you're still trying to figure it all out. And you're going, well, Jesus went up here. Well, well, could he come back in 40 AD? Well, 40 AD came and Jesus didn't come back yet. So they're like, well, in the Old Testament, God judged Israel for 70 years. So maybe 70 AD, Jesus will come back. <laughs> so my thought is, as I'm reading 2 Peter, is Peter's about to die. And I wonder if he's thinking it's only four more years and then Jesus is coming back. So let me write this to you. And as we go through 2 Peter, you'll see there's some places in 2 Peter where it sounds like Peter is expecting the rapture immediately and then the coming of Christ seven years later. And so he's, he's in his mind, Peter always thought more of the second advent than the rapture. And in Paul's mind, Paul always thought more about the rapture and then the second advent. And that's an interesting. There's so many things like that that you see as you go through and you read the Bible. So Peter and Paul were contemporaries. They knew each other. Their ministries overlapped. Some teach that Peter and Paul uh, never ever preached the same message. They always preached two different messages, but that is not true. Those are your hyper-dispensationalists. And if you ever listen to a hyper-dispensationalist, he'll say, well, Peter preached one message and Paul preached another, and they never preached the same thing. Not all, but many of your hyper-dispensationalists say, well, Peter and the, and the early church that were Jews, well, they aren't part of the body of Christ. I do not believe that. I believe the body of Christ started at the cross. And so the body of Christ is all those who came to Christ as soon as Jesus died and was buried and rose again. So I clearly see Peter and the early apostles as part of the body of Christ. And I clearly see, because I actually read the Bible, I sometimes wonder about these hyper-dispensationalists, but I clearly see that Paul and Peter got together and talked. And many of the things that God revealed to Paul were revealed to Peter. And Peter accepted those teachings. So what you have to do is you have to understand the Bible. The book of Acts is a transitional book. It starts out one way and then goes a different way. It starts out to Jews, then it ends up going to the church. It starts out with Peter, ends with Paul. It starts out with Israel, ends up with the body of Christ, the church. So there's a lot of transition taking place there in the book of Acts. Now, a lot of people will go to the Bible and they'll go to Acts 2.38. And they'll say, well, Acts 2.38 is what Peter preached. And that's correct. Acts 2.38 was the early message in the book of Acts. And it was be baptized in water to get the Holy Spirit. Is that the plan of salvation today? It is not. That's not how we're saved today. But yet there's a whole denomination called the Church of Christ that says water baptism saves. Uh, that's not what the hymn book says. And that's not what the Bible says. You know, in the hymn books... 
uh, we have a song. Have you heard the joyful news? Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It's all about Jesus and that blood that saves us. I guess the Church of Christ has to change the hymn book and sing, Water saves, water saves, because they believe you're saved by water baptism. No, if you read the entire rest of the Bible, you find out it's not water baptism that saves us. But that was the early message of Peter. And because of that, many of your hyper-dispensationalists say, well, that was Peter's message, and it's not the same as Paul. So Peter and Paul preach different messages, so you can't listen to anything Peter says today, only listen to Paul. I say it like this. Peter did teach that in the beginning, but he taught it to Jews, and then God showed them, look, the Jews are done with me. The, the, the nation of Israel rejected me. Go to Gentiles, and go to Jews that will listen, and preach this now. And it's no longer water baptism that saves you. It's what are you trusting in to get you to heaven. It's trust in the blood of Christ. So, and by the way, let me say, revelation. There's a lot of revelation taking place in the book of Acts. And God has called this guy Paul and given him many revelations. And God revealed things to him. So there are things that are continuing through the book of Acts that are continually being revealed to Paul. And then Paul dispersed that to the rest of the church, and the rest of the church gets on the same page as Paul. Let me show you that. Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. Jesus Christ is speaking in Acts 1, 5, and he says, John indeed baptized with water. Okay, A lot of people, they get fixated with water, and they, they have this thinking that water will wash my sins away. That's not what the Bible says. It says that we're washed in the blood of Christ. It's the blood that washes our sins away. Water, all it does is get you wet. But the blood penetrates to the soul and cleanses our soul. Water doesn't save. So in Acts chapter 1, before Jesus goes back up to heaven, he says, John indeed baptized with water, but she should be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. So we see a clear revelation of Jesus Christ of the difference between water baptism versus Holy Spirit baptism. So in the beginning of Acts, yes, there is a message of, hey, get baptized in water, but that was a message to Jews. Holy Spirit baptism is a message to all who believe. And when you believe, then you receive the Holy Spirit and you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. So it's through faith. There's, there's a transition. See the book of Acts, our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, to learn more about that. So you clearly do see Peter preaching a different message at the beginning of Acts. So hyperdispensationists are right to that point. But... If you continue reading the book of Acts, you see Peter realizing, oh, that message was for Jews, they rejected, okay, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to start preaching the new revelation that it's no longer water. Now, how do we know that? Well, Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. And that's when God says, okay, I'm going to start changing, I'm going to go away from the Jews, go away from Israel, because Israel no longer wants me as their Messiah, I'm going to start taking the message to Gentiles. Now, not just Gentiles. Jews can still be saved today, but they've got to be saved by the same message of Paul. So, in chapter 8, we see uh, Ethiopian eunuch. God goes from Jews to someone who's a Jewish proselyte, and then eventually to the Gentiles with a new message of salvation. And it's not the message of water baptism saves. It's the message of faith in the blood of Christ is what justifies us and saves us. So, chapter 10... Uh, Peter goes and preaches to some Gentiles. And he sees these Gentiles get saved and he gets shocked. He's like, what? Gentiles got the Holy Spirit? Now, I don't have time to read that, but that's in uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 43 through 45. And guess what? They didn't get the Holy Spirit through water baptism. They got the Holy Spirit when they believed. So salvation is by believing. And in Acts 11, 16, 11, 16, look at the revealing words of Peter. Peter says, Then I remembered the words of the Lord Jesus Christ over here in Acts 1, 5. How he said, John indeed baptized in water, but she should be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Peter goes, Oh, I see it. It was right there in the very first chapter of Acts that we're going to do it this way for a while, but then God goes, But eventually my plan is to do it this way. 
So there's a change that takes place in the book of Acts. There's some revelation going on. So the book of Acts is a book of transition. That's why my old pastor said you better be careful because you can hang your neck in the book of Acts. And that's why there's so many different denominations in the world today because many of them don't read the entire book of Acts. They just go a couple chapters and they go, well, that's good enough for me. That's my doctrine for today. It's like, no, that doctrine has changed. God changed from here to here. And it was all based upon whether the Jews accepted their Messiah or not. And the fact that they didn't, God says, okay, then it's going to be like this. Okay? And I call that, and I don't, I don't think I've ever heard any other preacher preach this, but I call that the difference between the who and the what of salvation. And it's so simple because it's right there in the scriptures if you just see it. When it first started in the book of Acts, all the emphasis was who he was. Jesus is the Christ. Uh, believe in his name. Believe who he is. Jesus even asked his disciples, Who do you believe that I, the Son of Man, is? Who am I? Believe in who I am. Believe in the name, in the name. Believe in the name of Jesus. It was believed that he was the Messiah because the name Jesus is Jehovah saves. So Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, the same Jehovah as the Old Testament, as the Messiah, as the Christ came to die for our sins. And had they accepted who he was as a nation, he could have brought in his kingdom right there. But they didn't. So God says, okay, come here, Paul. I want you to realize that I had a twofold uh, job here. I came not only to be their king, but in the back of my mind, I knew they would reject me. So I came to be their sacrifice. I came to be the blood atonement. I am the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So it's not just believing who I am that saves me. Paul, I want you to go tell people they have to believe in what I did to be saved. And that's what God revealed to Paul in uh, Acts 13, verse 38 through 39. The first time in the book of Acts where we see the word justified. And God revealed to Paul, it's a revelation, that we're justified by faith without works. Without keeping the law. You see, we're no longer under the law. Christ is the end of the law to all who believe, Romans 10, 4. So God sent out Paul, and Paul goes preaching this, and then in Acts chapter 15, the early church comes together, and they go, uh, what do we do with this? And Peter stands up, and Peter goes, well, I believe that we shall be saved by grace through faith, even as they. So, so he says, I, I reject my message of water baptism to get the Holy Spirit. I see the transition. I live through it, Peter says, and I accept Paul's message that it's salvation through grace. Grace through faith. Faith in what? Faith in the blood. So you clearly see Peter and Paul getting in the same page. Now, some of your hyperdispensationalists say, well, we don't believe that. We believe they always preach two different things. Well, I'm sorry, you're wrong. And we clearly saw that in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, we see Peter preaching the message of justified through his blood, redeemed, redemption through the blood of Christ, the message that God revealed to Paul. And 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. The law was all about keeping the tradition. How are you redeemed? Verse 19, But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Not the water. See, Peter is teaching a different message now than he did in Acts 2.38. He's teaching, no, it's the blood. It's not the water. And it's the blood that redeems us. So I clearly see God revealing this message of justified, of justification, to Paul, and this is the message that Peter accepts and begins preaching. So when I say that, that's why I say we can and should read and study the book of First and Second Peter. Now there are some hyper-dispensationalists out there that don't believe that. Now I've taught for years what the Bible teaches, that we're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth. And uh, so we do that. But the hyper-dispensationalists, they don't rightly divide. They over-divide, and they go, no... This is us today, Paul. Everything Peter says is not for us today, so we're just here in Paul. And I've even heard a couple of them. Now, not all of them. There are a lot, a lot of different ones. So they don't always believe the exact same thing, but they do have some things in common. But I've even heard some of them say, you should never read Peter. You shouldn't read any books of the Bible except Paul's books. And I'm like, no, the Bible says all Scripture is given for admonition and for learning and things. We're supposed to read the entire Bible. So where Peter lines up with Paul, that's for us today. Okay, I don't know how to say it or make it any more simple than that. Okay, This is our introduction to the book of 2 Peter. I don't even think we'll get to the text today, uh, but this is just my introduction. Um, next time we will start actually in verse 1, probably. 
Um, but I want you to see that, that we have to take First and Second Peter. Now, there is a dual application. There are some things in First Peter that I showed you that don't make sense. They only make sense in the tribulation. Maybe in Second Peter we might see some things like that. So there's a dual application that Peter is talking to because Peter loved the Jews more than the Gentiles. And although Peter did win some Gentiles to the Lord, it seems like he decided, you know what, I'm just going to be a missionary to Jews. He didn't want to go out of his way to reach Gentiles. Well, Paul did. Paul's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go get the Gentiles saved. But what's funny is when you read the whole book of Acts, it seems like everywhere Paul went, he went to the synagogue first, and then he went to the Gentiles. <laughs> And that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So it seems like he always wanted to see Jews saved. So Jews can be saved today. I get emails sometimes, people saying, well, Brother Breaker, uh, can a Jew get saved today? Yes. How? Well, they have to come through Paul's gospel. And Paul's gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And that's the gospel that God revealed to Paul. Let me show you that real quick. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. So this is something that a lot of people who claim to be Christians, if they're going to a denominational church that doesn't rightly divide, doesn't study the Bible, they don't get taught. But if you read the Bible, you can't deny what I'm telling you because it's all right there. And it's sad that so many of your so-called denominations today are so shallow. They don't do Bible reading. They just A lot of them just stick with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's all they teach. I've had people contact me and say, Brother Breaker, I went to church for 20, 30, 40 years. And I never knew anything. The preacher only preached Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He always told me, don't ever read any more of the Bible. It's too confusing. <laughs> and, I, and they say, I watched a couple of your videos, and it's just like, wow. It opened my eyes to the truth of the Bible, and it's made me want to study more. It's helped me to understand what it means to rightly divide. And boy, I can't get enough of reading Paul and, and, and First, Second Peter, and, and I can't get enough of reading the Word because now I understand it. You got to understand dispensations. We are in this dispensation today, the church. We're not in the tribulation yet. We're not in the millennium. We're not back here under the law. And so when you get a hold of all this, it's exciting to finally understand the word of God. Galatians 1:12, Paul says this. Uh, let's ver go to verse 11 first. Galatians 1:11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, neither I received it of man. Neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I'm teaching you correctly, according to the Bible, that the book of Acts is a transition book. And God is dealing with the Jews in his earthly ministry, and shortly thereafter, through his apostles. But the Jews reject him, so God goes, okay, more revelation. And this revelation is going to go to Paul. Uh, some of it went to uh, old Peter. You know, God revealed to Peter, hey, go, go get some Gentiles. Tell them how, how Jesus is, is who he is. And, and they believed and they got the Holy Spirit. They became part of the body of Christ, those Gentiles, in Acts chapter 10 and 11. But more revelation just kept coming to Paul. And the greatest of those revelations is the revelation of the gospel. And this is the way that I explain it is the difference of the who versus what. At the beginning, Peter was preaching who Jesus was and really trying to stress, He is the Lord. He is the Messiah. Believe that, Israel. He is the Christ. But when they rejected Him, God said, Okay, Paul, this is what I want. I want you to show people that salvation is by what I did. It was me paying for their sins. I paid the penalty. I paid the penalty on the cross for sins. Sins are paid for. Now forgiveness is offered through all who will come by faith in my blood. And if you'll trust in what I did, that's the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, how he died, then you're saved. Now I don't know how to make that any more clearer than just to say it. And I say all that to say this, clearly Peter accepted the message of Paul and the revelations to Paul. And we read that in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, why he's out there telling you, yeah, it's through the blood. It's, it's not the who message, it's in 1 Peter, he's telling the what message. He's going along, he's, he's going with Paul. Yet, even with all that stated, there were still some things that Peter still didn't get that God revealed to Paul. And Peter confesses that in 2 Peter in the last chapter. So let's run over there real quick and let me show you this. 2 Peter chapter 3. So much of the doctrine of Peter lines up with Paul in the later book of Acts. But if all you go to is the early book of Acts and try to find what Peter says there, you're going to have problems because that's not the gospel for today. 
It doesn't matter if you believe who Jesus is. If you think Jesus is the Messiah, that's great. That didn't save you. The way to be saved today is to believe in what Jesus did. Trust in the blood of Christ. That's salvation. And that's what you get if you just simply read the book of Acts and read all the epistles of Paul. Then you get that. So Peter understood most of that, but there were still a couple things that Peter says, you know what, I, there's some things God told Paul that I, I'm still scratching my head trying to figure out. That's why we don't follow Peter as our apostle today. Yes, we can take his writings. Yes, we can glean from them and accept a lot of what he says. But Paul said he is the apostle of the Gentiles. Romans 11.13. So he is our apostle today. Paul. Paul is our apostle. Not Peter. And I find that so funny because the Catholic Church wants to base their whole religion on Peter and they ignore Paul. <laughs> you go over to Rome and the, the big head honcho is sitting in St. Peter's. Well, many years ago, the Protestant Reformation uh, got out of the Catholic Church. And in England, they set up St. Paul's. And that's the big cathedral. <laughs> it's kind of funny. There's Peter and Paul. And to this day, there's a lot of people that are still trying to pit Peter against Paul and vice versa. But what you have to understand is Peter did preach different in the beginning. But then God revealed some things to Paul and Peter goes, okay, I'm over here now. We're together. Yet many religions, they divide and say, Paul, <clears throat> to heck with you. We're following the early Peter. We don't want the Peter that got in, in, in with Paul. Okay? This, I don't know how else to say it. But let's look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. And look what it says here in verse 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Okay, so he's talking about salvation. And in the context of salvation, it's all about Paul. Why? Because God revealed to Paul the way of salvation for us today. And it's not Acts 2.38. It's the way God revealed to Paul. It's through faith, justified by faith, justified by his blood, as he says in the book of Romans. And he says, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. What's the wisdom given unto him? Revelation of God. So it's God's revelation. God's revelation revealed to who? To Paul. So God revealed to Paul and said, Paul, this is what you preach during the church age. This is how you preach. It's the blood. Redeemed through the blood. And Peter says, yeah, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Okay? But then, look what he says in 2 Peter 3.16. He mentions our beloved brother Paul. Then verse 16 says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. <laughs> he says, man, God really revealed a lot of stuff to Paul. And salvation is through the gospel that God revealed to Paul. But I'm going to tell you something. There's some things that God revealed to Paul that are just hard to understand. And I just scratch my head and I just kind of go, okay, I believe it. I don't quite understand it, but I believe it, Lord. That's Peter. Now, why am I going on this? Why am I talking about this? All right, let me finish reading this here in just a second. But there are people out there, and they're growing in numbers, unfortunately, here in the last days. And more and more, I'm seeing people sending me emails and things saying, Hey, have you heard this guy on YouTube? He's saying this now. More and more people are saying, Paul shouldn't be in the Bible. And more and more people claim to be Christians who are attacking Paul. And they say, no, no, we're still under the Old Testament. All right, you're false. You're a liar. You're, you're rejecting the revelation of God to Paul, which is the, the way of salvation. So you're wrong. Other people say, no, we're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest of the Bible doesn't apply to us. Okay, you're wrong. But they say we reject Paul. Other people say, well, we accept Peter in the early book of Acts, but we reject Paul completely, so we go back to this water. Well, you're trying to accept the message that's to Jews, not for us. So you're wrong. You see how that works? If the devil can kick out Paul, then the world can't be saved. Because Paul tells us in Romans 2.16 that when God shall judge the secrets of men according to my gospel. Paul tells, tells us in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The only way to be saved is through what God told Paul to tell us is the way of salvation, and that we have to believe. All right, Acts 16, 30, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. So salvation today is through the revelations given to Paul. If you get Paul out of the Bible, if you kick Paul out, then you are going to go to hell. I hate to say it. 
Because if you, unless you come to the revelation given to Paul that salvation is by faith in what Jesus did, faith in the blood, you're lost. And yet all over America and all over the world we have false denominations, people claiming to be Christians, who are going around saying, no, we reject Paul. We don't think Paul should be in the Bible. Why, Paul is a liar and a deceiver, and he, he weaseled himself into Christianity and tried to take it over and went around telling everybody, you got to believe me and follow me. And follow. That's not what Paul did. Paul was humble. Paul killed people before he was saved. He felt bad about that. But God saved him anyway. So Paul says, you know what? I want to make up for that. I want to serve the Lord because I was persecuting the early church. So God called Paul. Paul even tells us, God called me from my mother's womb. And Paul goes out preaching and teaching. And Paul is a minister of God to the Gentiles. See that in Romans chapter 15. So you cannot take Paul out of the Bible. If you do, you're damning your soul to hell. Because you're rejecting the apostle that God called for us, who he gave the gospel to for us. That is the gospel of salvation. All right, you understand that? These people that get rid of Paul are the false prophets that Peter is going to warn us against in 2 Peter. Now, continue here in 2 Peter chapter 3. An account of the long-suffering of, of our Lord is salvation. I'm reading verse 15 again. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. All right. So, the same people that are reading Peter's letter have already read Paul's letter. So both Peter and Paul are sending their epistles to the same group. Who's that? The body of Christ. Whether they were Jew or Gentile, they're all in the same body and they're all saved now through faith in the blood of Christ. And then it says here in verse 16, and also in all his epistles. Who? Paul's. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. He's like, you know, God is really using Paul, but there's some things Paul's teaching that I just don't quite understand. But he says, but, but it's right. It's the way to be saved. It's what God said. Which they that are unlearned, now watch this, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter says, do not take the writings of Paul and twist them. Do not change what Paul said. And yet that's what the Gnostic uh, versions of the Bible are. There are many different uh, versions out there, the Alexandrian text, the corrupted text, in which they go and they change many of the things that Paul taught. That's very sad. As a matter of fact, let's read verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. What is the error of the wicked? Those that are trying to get rid of Paul and his teachings, or else change them, and try to make people turn against Paul. And he warns us not to rest the scriptures to our own destruction. I looked up the word rest, and it means to twist, to distort, and to pervert. There are people out there that are twisting, distorting, and perverting the scriptures, and teaching a false doctrine, and they all have something in common. They all teach against Paul. Or they try to rest, or change, or pervert Paul's teachings. But Paul's teachings are directly from God. So if you are against Paul, you are against God. Okay? I don't know how to say it any simpler than that. Now, so the way that he's saying it here in verse 16, he says that they rest the other scriptures unto their own destruction. It sounds like exactly what Paul said, to rightly divide. And, and Peter here is telling us there's people that aren't rightly dividing. So listen to Paul, where he says rightly divide. So let's go to 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul says, study... To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, the first word there is study. So Paul tells us we need to go to the Bible and we need to study. Do you realize the King James Bible is the only Bible that says that? All new versions of the Bible change that. No thanks. No, the Bible. This is the only command in the whole New Testament for us to study the Bible. And new versions say, oh, we can't have that. Oh, oh, no, no, change it, change it. So they change it to procure yourself to do due diligence or something. And when you read it in, a, in another version, it sounds like you're saved by works. It doesn't sound like study the Bible. Now people say, well, the word in Greek is, who cares what the word in Greek is? I know what the word in Greek is. Do you? I've studied Greek. I had three years of Greek in college. But the context of something always shows how it must be translated. And clearly, the entire context of that sentence 
is learning how to take the Bible and rightly dividing it and meditating upon it and learning, okay, now this is for that and this is for today. This was for them back then. This is for Jews. This is for us. That's rightly dividing the word of truth. The only way you can rightly divide the word of truth is if you actually study it. So the King James Bible is correct with the word study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. New versions take out the word study. That right there ought to give you a great big blinking red light when it comes to new versions of the Bible. It might make you, make you go, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Why don't new versions want you to study? Because if you study, like I said in the beginning of this sermon, you'll find out they take out whole words. Like the NIV has less words in it than the King James. Matter of fact, it has way over 60,000 words, the NIV, taken out of it. But if you study, you'd see that. So, oh, no, no, please don't study. <laughs> Go to 2 Timothy 2.15 in the NIV and you won't find the word study because they don't want you to. But that's the only command in the Word of God, the King James Bible, that says study to show thyself approved unto God. All right? So it's important that we study. So we must rightly divide, as Paul puts it. Now, Peter and Paul have a lot of doctrine in common. So 1 Peter was all about suffering, and it was written about 60 A.D. So 1 Peter was written around 60 A.D., and, you know, these are estimates, the best we can come up with, but they're, they're very close. I mean, that's six years later uh, that he would have written six, Second Peter. So he was suffering, and I told you that there was some persecution from Rome against Christians during that time. Matter of fact, Nero burned down Rome around that time. So that's quite interesting. So First Peter is all about suffering. And what 1 Peter is, is a whole lot of milk. Now let me show you the difference between milk and meat, okay? We have milk, and we have meat. And the Word of God is likened unto both. And to me, 1 Peter is the milk. The book of 1 Peter has five chapters, and it's a whole lot of milk. The book of 2 Peter has only three chapters. But there's a lot of meat in it. There's, in the book of 2 Peter, there's a whole lot more doctrine and profound doctrine than there is in 1 Peter. So milk is what's for early Christians. So milk is basic Bible doctrine. Basic doctrine. And one of the most basic doctrines is like he said, uh, as a Christian, be nice. Don't speak evil of other people and things like that. Uh, grow in grace and knowledge and charity. Be nice. Meat in the Bible is more than just basic doctrine. That's the more profound, the more profound teachings in the Bible. And boy, there's a lot of those, and I enjoy giving a lot of meat. I enjoy studying the Bible and getting into the deep things of the Bible. But when a person just gets saved, what they need is they need milk. And so let's go to 1 Peter 2, 2. And Peter recognized this. Peter understood this. And when you're talking about the Bible and teaching the Bible, there's two types of ways to teach the Bible. You teach milk and you teach meat. The milk is more basic doctrine for new Christians, while meat is a guy who's been a Christian for a long time and knows a lot of Bible. Okay, let's go into the deeper things. Let's get into some real fun Bible studies and get into some profound stuff. Stuff that goes way over the head of, an early, of a, a recent Christian. <laughs> Somebody who just got saved, they'd be like, what's he talking about? You see what I'm saying? So there's milk and there's meat. And both Peter and Paul use that terminology, speaking of the Bible, as milk and meat. Let me show you and just another thing that shows Peter and Paul were on the same page, okay? 1 Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So the book of 1 Peter is a whole lot of milk, just basic Christian doctrine. And it's got five chapters. But as you get into 2 Peter, it has only three chapters, but boy, there's a lot of profound stuff in it. It's interesting. So why? Well, because Peter wants you to grow. He wants you to grow as a Christian, not just know the basic doctrines. He wants you to read the Bible and study the Bible for yourself and learn more of the Bible so that you can get some meat. Now let's look at Paul. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Paul uses the same terminology, speaking of the Bible as milk and as of meat. And in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. He's writing to them and saying, Why don't you guys want to hear what I have to say? Verse 12, For when 
For the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teacheth you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. So milk is the basic simple doctrines, or as he calls them, the first principles. And the meat is the more profound. Strong meat is way more profound doctrine. Uh, look at verse um, 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So it's like you're a babe in Christ when you're saved, when you're born again. You're a babe in Christ. And what does a baby need? A babe, by the way, is a baby. Well, you don't give a brand spanking new baby that was just born two months ago a big steak and go, okay, eat it. He doesn't even have teeth, so he can't eat it. He has to have milk. And then the baby grows over a couple of years, and then it gets teeth in, and eventually it can start eating meat. So meat is for the more skilled, the more grown up, if you will. Um, verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay? Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. So I want you to get a hold of that and the difference between milk and meat. Most of my sermons are meat. I kind of give you some deep, heavy, profound things of the Word of God. I love to. But every now and then I have to come back and give you some milk. And I, I'm not good at the milk because I just, I, I've studied the Bible, I know the Bible, and I love the meat. I like a steak more than I like milk. Um, although, I do love some fresh goat's milk. Oh, man. I can drink a whole, uh, you know, half gallon, just blah, 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 and drink the whole thing down or whatever. I really do like milk. So milk and meat have their place, but meat is for those that are strong. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul again, speaking about the scripture and doctrine, and likens it unto milk. 3 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. So, what is the milk, the basic doctrine? Well, it sounds like it's teaching people not to fight one another. Look at verse 3. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there are among you envying and strife and divisions, and you are not carnal, and walk as men. Uh, go back to uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 1. Here's your milk. 1 Peter 2, 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk. So milk is basically teaching, hey, be a Christian. Grow up. Don't be a child. Don't be angry. Don't be mad. Don't be hateful. Don't attack other Christians. Don't put others down. Don't lie about other Christians. Don't mock them. Don't spit upon them. Don't make fun of them like some of these Christians on YouTube like to do. Uh, you know, I've got my people that hate me, and that's fine. I don't care. I love them in the Lord if they're Christians. But many of them are not giving any meat whatsoever, and yet they claim to be Bible teachers. They don't even give you milk. They have not even taking the milk of the word. They're not even growing as Christians because all they live to do is pounce upon and attack another brother in Christ. You need the milk of the word, and you need to realize you need to learn to not be like that. Christians are not supposed to attack and talk evil of and, and, and make fun of and lie about other Christians. That's basic Bible doctrine. And if a guy hasn't learned that, he's still a baby in Christ. I don't care if he's 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. He's still a baby in Christ, and he needs milk. So, hope you learned that. Amen. Uh, I want to give you milk. Um, a lot of times there's people that watch me that have grown, and they need more meat. But I still realize there's a lot of people out there that haven't grown as a Christian, and they sure need some milk. Now, a lot more we need to get into. So, Peter wanted to lay out some more profound doctrines in 2 Peter. He felt like I gave you a lot of milk in 1 Peter. Which, by the way, what's it about? Suffering. You know, if you don't like another Christian, then just suffer. Put up with it. Don't go around talking bad about them, making videos about them, lying about them, saying dumb. Just say, you know what, I just don't like him. But I'm just going to go do my thing and leave him alone. And suffer him to be whatever he is and to do whatever he does. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of Christians can't do that. They can't get their eyes on the Scripture and learn it. They can't get their eyes on the Lord. All they do is get their eyes on you, and they're just watching you. And the only thing they live for is to see you do something or say something that they don't like. So they go, aha, well, you get ready. And you know what that is? That's a bully, and that's a baby. 
And that's somebody that doesn't grow in grace. Are they saved? I hope so. If they are, then they're just backslidden, carnal Christians. And they need to grow up. If they aren't saved, well then, maybe that's why they're doing the things they're doing. Maybe they're led of a devil. Maybe they have a demon in them that's that's making them want to do that. You know, I've got these people on YouTube that attack me. I think the um, at one time, I think 12 videos in one day some guy made against me. Well, I, I looked the other day and somebody counted it up for me and said, this guy made 14 videos against you in one day or something like that. I'm like, Whew. you know, there comes a time when you go, why? Why am I that important? Are, are you a stalker? Why are you stalking me? I mean, that's kind of scary that a person is that obsessed with Robert Breaker and that they only live to make videos in which they attack me and call me names. Dumb, stupid, moron, idiot, phony, liar, jerk. I mean, like, dude, you need the milk. You think you're so smart and you're out there trying to give people meat. You need to get back to the milk, okay? Because you're carnal, according to the Word of God. Now, that's not my opinion, okay? I'm not attacking you or him or whatever. I'm just saying, this is milk, this is meat. And it's all about growing. We grow based upon our diet, what we eat. Is their diet the Word of God? If it was, they would have some charity. They would have some grace. They would have some love. They would have some more knowledge of the Scriptures. And they would know, hey, uh, treating other Christians mean and poorly and mocking and making fun of them is not the way God said that we as Christians are supposed to live. Okay? Boy, how'd I get it off on that? So anyway, let's go back to um, 2 Peter 3.18. The last words, or last sentence, if you will, a couple of sentences, the last paragraph of Peter. The last thing Peter says, you know, if someone was dying and you and you know they're about to die, you just you can't wait. You want to know what what are they what's their last words? You know, you, you want to hear the last thing someone says. And usually the last thing that someone says, it, it goes up here and you memorize it and you and you remember it for the rest of your life. I wish my dad could have spoke. When my dad died, he was unable to speak. The, the, the blood had covered out into his brain, and, had, and he had a, a, a blood vessel break, and, and it was pushing on a part of his brain where he, he couldn't speak. But I could see his eyes. I could see you go like this, and he could say, you know, I could see in the, the love in his eyes, like, son, I love you. But he couldn't speak. And uh, to this day, I don't remember what the last words of my dad were, because he laid up in the hospital for three days before he died and didn't speak. But I didn't leave him his side. I didn't leave his side. I stayed there for three days, hoping he could just get one word out. And all I, all I did is say, Dad, I love you. And I remember he squeezed my hand. And to me, that was him saying, I love you too, son. So really, those would be his last words probably if he could have spoken. But all I have is a hand squeeze as, as that, to confirm that. But here are the last words of Peter. And look what he says. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter says, here's the milk. Here, here's what I wanted you to, to do. I gave you a whole lot of milk in my first epistle. I gave you a lot of meat in my second epistle. But my desire is that you grow in grace. You know what grace is? Grace is putting up with somebody you don't like. Grace is biting your tongue and not saying things you shouldn't. Grace is not attacking other Christians and putting them down and saying horrible, hateful things about them. That is not growing, and that is not grace. Charity. Look, look how he ends 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 14. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, 1 Peter ends with charity. Have you got any? <laughs> if you understand the milk... The, the milk of the Bible is a basic doctrine. And the most basic doctrine is, hey, have some charity. And then it says uh, charity, and then it says peace. If you accept the teachings of the Scriptures and you obey it, like where it says, you know, don't talk evil of other Christians and things like that, then you'll have peace with other Christians if you practice charity. But if you don't, what did Paul say? You're carnal. All you focus on is strife and envy and division among other Christians. Okay, then you haven't grown up. You need to grow up. Just grow up already. Amen? <laughs> it is sad there's a lot of Christians out there that haven't grown up. Well, I hope you read 1 Peter. I hope you read 2 Peter. 
So, Peter wanted to lay out some more profound doctrines. He felt like he gave you a lot of milk in chapter or in 1 Peter. So now he wants you in 2 Peter to know some things. And he says, I want to give you some more doctrine. A little bit more profound teachings. And there's a lot in that. Now, let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at the difference between 1 and 2 Peter. Okay, I showed you the differences about how 1 Peter and 2 Peter end. And 1 Peter ends in 1 Peter 5.14 with a kiss of charity. Why, well, that's, that's affection. Have affection one to another. If you're a brother in Christ and I'm a brother in Christ, we should love one another, not hate one another. Okay? That's basic Bible doctrine. That's milk. In 2 Peter 3.18, he says, grow in grace and knowledge. You need to know something. And you need to know what the Bible says. And so that's what he says. Now, Peter wanted to see Christians grow in knowledge. Knowledge, of course, would be knowing the Bible, knowing sound doctrine. So he wanted you to have sound doctrine. Paul wanted that too. But when we look at Peter and what happens in his first epistle and then in his second epistle, we see some interesting stuff. 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. I think I talk about this in my sermon on YouTube entitled, The Seven things that Peter says are precious. In First and Second Peter, I went through and read those and found seven things that Peter said were precious. I never heard anybody else preach on that, uh, but God gave me that message. First Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. When I read that, in my mind, I read it like this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. It almost sounds like he's prideful. Like he's saying, look at me, I am Peter. Now, Peter means rock. I am a rock and I'm an apostle. Look at me, aren't I? So, you know, and it's like, oh, okay. Now, maybe he's not writing it like that. Maybe he's just saying who he is because certainly he was an apostle. But it's just interesting how he says it that way compared to how he says it in the beginning of 2 Peter. So the way he starts out 1 Peter is way different than how he starts out 2 Peter, it almost looks like there's some humbling that took place. Like he was humbled in between the writing of these two epistles. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now Simon means sifting sand. <laughs> so he doesn't come out and say, I'm a rocking apostle, listen to me. He comes out and goes, well, I'm Simon Peter. I'm I'm, I'm a rock on sifting sand. I've, I've gone through some stuff, and I'm a servant of Jesus. Oh, and by the way, I'm an apostle. <laughs> Do you see what I see? I kind of see a little bit of a humility there. There was some humbling that took place. Either he humbled himself, or God humbled him. Now, what is humbling? Suffering. What is the theme of 1 Peter? Suffering. So, if you're somebody that has taken the milk of the Word, but you haven't grown thereby, you're not accepting it, you're, you're claiming to be a Christian, but you're rebellious, but you're backslidden, but you're carnal, but you're angry, but you're hateful, you have a critical spirit, you just want to attack and put down other Christians, you better watch out. Suffering is coming to you, because you're not serving God. Now, the Bible does say, Yea, that all live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yes, we're all going to suffer, no matter what. But sometimes your suffering is worse than it could be because of the way you're living as a Christian. The Bible does say, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And sometimes God looks down from heaven and looks at a guy and goes, All right, you're saved, but why are you acting like that? Gabriel, you know what we ought to do? Hey, Michael, let's just go ahead and, 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 and let's make him sick. Let's let him have, I don't know, uh, uh, problems in his health. Let's let his wife leave him. Let's let his car break down. Let's let him lose his job. Let, let's just see what happens if this guy goes through these things. You know, that's what the book of Job was about. The, the devil came to God and says, look at Job. He has all this stuff. Well, if you took any of that stuff, he'd curse you. And God goes, really? Well, let's find out. And he gave permission to the devil to go take all that stuff away from Job. Just to see if Job would curse God. You know what? He didn't. Thankfully, he did not curse God. Now, he was full of pride, though, and that was the issue of, of Job, was he never let go of his pride until the end. And he finally says, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I'm just a sinner. And uh, so you better be careful, all right? Have you accepted the milk of the Word? Do you love other Christians? Do you practice charity and grace? Do you care about other brothers in Christ? Or do you just live to put them down and attack and name call? If so, shame on you. Shame on you. 
you're going to go through some things. Well, it's like he humbled himself or else God humbled him in between the writing of First and Second Peter. Now this book of Second Peter is Peter's swan song, just like Second Timothy was the swan song of Paul. Peter is about to die for his faith in Jesus Christ. He's about to be killed by Rome. So uh, he was in Babylon. Maybe he came back to Rome. I don't remember. I know I've read Fox's Book of Martyrs that tell how he was supposedly killed or whatever. But, um, you know, you can't always go by those accounts. But we do know that Peter tells us in 2 Peter that he's about to die. And so this is his last epistle. And we see that in 2 Peter 1.13. 2 Peter 1.13, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, which, by the way, he's talking about his body, and unfortunately, new versions of the Bible change this, which I think is horrible, because that's the right term, tabernacle, because when you're saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He tabernacles in you. He comes into you. Your body, Paul calls it a temple. Your body is a temple. Your body is a tabernacle. New versions just change that to body. And you lose so much, because that ties into so many other things. How in the Old Testament God dwelt in the tabernacle among his people. Well, how much greater it is in the New Testament that we are the tabernacle. We don't have to go to some building. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. What a blessing. But as long as I'm in this tabernacle, stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. I must die. I must shuffle off my immortal coil, like Shakespeare says. Put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. He says, I'm about to die. They're going to kill me, and I'm going, to, I'm going to leave this body, this tabernacle. So Peter dies as a martyr for Jesus Christ shortly after this. And so he is sitting there in a jail cell, most likely writing this epistle, and thinking about his life, and thinking about his first epistle. I gave him a whole lot of milk. Now I want to give him a little bit more meat. And, you know, when you're about to die, you're thinking about a lot of things. So we have here the book of 2 Peter, and we have a man who's about to die. And he's saying, you know, I don't have much time, but I want to make sure you know this, 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 and this. So to me, that just shows the importance of the word of, of, uh, of Peter. Because he's about to die. He knows he's about to die. So he says, look, if there's anything I can impart to you before I go, it's this. And he gives us the three chapters. Why isn't it five? I don't know. Maybe he had to write quickly. I don't... But he gives us the three chapters, and there's a lot of meat there. And so I told you before that First Peter, all five chapters, a lot of basic doctrine. Well, there's a lot of meat in Second Peter. A lot of doctrine. So I'm anxious to get it started on this teaching with you. This has been the introduction. Next time we'll start actually in the text, going verse by verse. And I can't wait to see how it turns out. Uh, we went a long time on First Peter, and I taught a lot because there was a lot to, to teach. So I'm anxious to see if we go through quickly or if we actually go through and we take a, a long time to get through um, 2 Peter. But I love the book of 2 Peter because there's a lot of amazing and interesting doctrine in that book. And it's uh, Old Testament, New Testament. It has to do with a lot of things. And so there's a lot of things that we're going to get into when we get to this book. So I'll see you next time as we start our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through 2 Peter. God bless.